So I'll get started with the weekly science hangout this evening. And first, I want to thank Pamela Gay for allowing me to use her slot. She's busy at a suborbital researchers conference right now and wasn't sure that she would be able to broadcast. And this is my first chance to host a hangout on air. So I'm, I'm delighted to be able to do that. And as my guest, I've chosen David Seal, a good friend of mine from JPL, who um, I've known for a very long time as a Cassini mission planner. Um, he's done that for, uh, what did you say, seven or eight years? And, uh, yeah, I, I did it in two stints, but uh, the most recent stint was 2002 to 2010. I'm still peripherally involved because it's just that exciting of a mission. I can't really tear myself away. So. Right, right. And, and of course, and now you're running the mission planning group at JPL, which, which I assume means that you've uh, been promoted, basically. Well, uh, that's kind of, it's funny. We can talk about this a little bit, too. It's kind of a managerial position, and sometimes that's a dreaded word around here as a manager. Uh, I, I like I like the, the the science community and the engineering community are are um, where a lot of the excitement is. The managers definitely participate in the mission as much as anybody. But um, but when you actually get to do real hard, meaty technical work, that's that's what I find the most rewarding. So so promotion, I suppose, it still lets me dabble in a variety of missions. So I definitely get more variety in my job than I did on Cassini. Well, as as Cassini mission planner, it was Dave's job to well part of Dave's job to help figure out uh, when the spacecraft would be going where around Saturn. And of course, a, a, a large orbiter like Cassini is mostly bound in orbit. It, you know, there's not a whole lot of flexibility that it has. But with uh, some ingenuity and a bunch of Titan flybys, they are able to uh, change the orbit of Cassini quite a lot in order to get close flybys of Titan and all of the other major icy moons and some of the minor ones as well. Um, and it's, it's always been fascinating for, to me to to uh, just imagine how complex a job that must be. So I thought that I'd ask David to describe a little bit about what a planner does, how the idea of a mission um, get, moves forward into the actual path that a mission takes, and the photographs and other data that it takes on the course of its mission. So sure. go ahead, Dave. Yeah, sure. Um, I think part of what we talked about the context for today's talk was talking about scientists and engineers. And, and my group is sort of in an interesting position in that you know, I'm an engineer, and most of us would consider ourselves engineers, but we sort of straddle the world between the engineers and the, t and the scientists. Um, most people, when they think of NASA, a lot of times they think just of, you know, scientists. You know, the phrase rocket science always comes to, to mind and gives us a bit of a, bit of a wince sometimes in, when we hear that um, uh, because it's really both scientists and engineers that participate. But, but it's, it's always a, a wince of, of, uh, of amusement. Um, Planning a mission like like Cassini, you know, you, it takes takes an equal partnership of of both camps. Um, you know, the the classic description of what a scientist is is someone who tries to understand and explore nature. You know, engineers. Um, uh, I mean, the scientists. You know, are are, are typically the, most of the people that you'll see on TV on the Discover Channel and and other uh, you know public outreach channels that where people are talking about space. Because they're the ones that can convey the story of what what nature is like, what's out there, what what the solar system is like. You know, you yourself w was trained in the field of science, and and now it's your mission as a science journalist to to carry that message uh, to the public. Um, and but at the same time, you know, I, I think mo almost everyone can can remember seeing pictures of engineers working on spacecraft and building things to go to go out to Saturn and, and other places to to get that science back and there's a different mindset in, involved with that. And they both have to work together, certainly on a mission like Cassini, to sort of carry the mission forward. You know, the scientists, they will tell the engineers what they want to study, and the engineers have to do their best to try to deliver a spacecraft and a mission that will do that. And the people in my group a lot of times tend to straddle the, the space between them because you can imagine that there's sort of a... Uh, you know, a friendly sort of give and take between those those two camps. You know, the scientists want to do, uh, you know, everything that they can think of to do. They want to study, you know, everything that interests them. And, and every scientist, you know, is interested in a, in a lot of different things, um, even outside of what their niche, niche is that they're currently studying. And, you know, a lot of times the engineers will say, well, I, that's that's really more than we can do. We, we don't know how to build that yet. And there's sort of a little bit of a push and pull that, that goes between them. And the mission planning group has to actually sit down and plan the mission and, and, and lay down the, the list of activities that has to happen one, you know, one after another and, and do all of the trade studies and analyses in support of that to, to figure out sort of what the mission can actually accomplish. So um, I think in your, 
in your intro on your blog, you use the phrase cat herding, and then sometimes it, it, it feels a little bit like that because, you know, there's definitely a wide group of people that all have their own desires, wishes, and, and ideas of what they think the mission is capable of doing. And uh, a lot of times people, like the people in my group, which are, which are also called systems engineers, they have to try to put together a package that, that makes sense and, and gives, gives everybody a little bit of what they want uh, and, and doesn't, isn't so optimistic that it's just unbuildable. Right. Okay. So I'm pretty familiar with the way that um, the Mars Exploration Rover operations are planned because that that very tactical kind of planning. They get images down from the rover in the afternoon. They over the rover's night they'll um, plan out what the rover will do the next day. They upload a set of commands and wait for the rover to do it, and then they they start all over again. But the uh, I know that it's very different with Cassini, and I'm wondering if you can um, explain a little bit about how we plan for Cassini to take the the pictures that it does. Sure. Um, there's you, you. You make a good point. There's um, each mission has a different balance of both tactical and strategic planning that has to happen. Um, Cassini actually does a lot of this similar kind of tactical planning that that you, you you speak of in terms where they have to sort of look kind of down at the at, the, at a very specific level of how are we going to accomplish this specific observation? How much time does this take? How much data, you know, is this going to send back? What what's the power level that's needed? And that's sort of, you know, like a game of chess, like what is exactly the tactics of my position? How am I going to make my next move, just single move? Um, and, and certainly because Cassini is conducting observations all the time, there's definitely a team of people that, that has to worry about exactly each observation and how that works. The strategic side of things, which is more of what my group does, is sort of like, you know, earlier in the mission life cycle, What's a typical day in the life look like? How, in general, are we going to accomplish our goals? Like, for the rovers, they would, you know, they would think about things like, well, how much power do we have? I mean, how long in any particular day do we have to drive? And what's the right balance of driving to a different destination versus, you know, studying rocks or taking samples or, you know, sampling the atmosphere, or that kind of thing, taking pictures? What's the right balance? You know, how soon around nightfall do we have to sort of scale things back, you know, and how long does it take to charge batteries, you know, during the day? That's more of a strategic kind of sense. Um, for Cassini, the kind of things that we did before we launched and before we got there w was exactly like the day in the life kind of kind of thing. You know, how much, how much time can we spend observing and how much time do we have to spend sort of sending data back to Earth? You know, what's a, what's a typical day going to look like? Um, and what does that look like? How, what is the balance of taking data to having to um, relay it back to Earth? Because Saturn is very far from Earth. Yeah, so yeah. Saturn, Saturn's ten times as far away from the Sun as the Earth is, and um, you know it, we only have a transmitter that's about the size of a pretty dim light bulb. In term, uh, that's about the power of a pretty dim light bulb. So it's it's a pretty faint signal. We can only uh, our our data recorders can only send back about a CD's worth of information, which is six to eight hundred uh, megabytes in a, in a particular day, uh, or th that's its capacity. Um, and it does turn out that we can get about all of that back in a tracking pass that's about eight hours long. So our typical day um, is about, you know, 16 hours of observation and, and eight hours of downlink. And that, that was, you know, I mean, our, our recorder was sized sort of with this day in the life in mind. So it was all part of one big analysis. How big should the recorder be? How how much power should our transmitter be? You know, how long does it take the combination of those two things? Uh, how long does it take to to get that to get that data back down? Fortunately, I think the whole the whole picture was driven by um, how the science instruments collect data. You know, um, they can they a typical day for them will get about that much data, um, and so. That's how we, I think, pretty much came up with the analysis. And we definitely had to push on them a little bit because they wanted probably, you know, a lot of them wanted to take more data than, than we could fit in one tracking pass. And sometimes we have to sort of wait a few days before we get everything down just because we don't have the tracking assets to get it down. So that's, that's the kind of analysis that, that mission planners do. You know, they, the engineers say, well, you know, we don't have enough power for a bigger transmitter. And the scientists say, well, we need a bigger transmitter because we can't get our data down. And we do a bunch of creative analyses and, and hopefully come to a position where the cliche that we say is always we make everyone equally unhappy. You know, we push the engineers a bit further than they'd like to push by maybe taking some of their power margin away to give, it, give us a higher power transmitter, 
and the scientists, we don't give the scientists everything they, they wanted because they were hoping to get more data down and there's a compromise struck. And that's, that's how building things, that's what building things is all about. You know, you, you have to strike compromises sometimes that, that, uh, that, that don't get everything you want but give you everything you need. Now, of course, with, with Cassini, I'm always thinking about beautiful pictures, and I imagine that that does take up a lot of the data stream, but, but um, I, I know Cassini has a lot of other instruments, and I, I'm wondering if any of them is as big a data hog as the uh, camera system is. Um, there are a number of instruments that are capable of bursting uh, at, at rates that are equal or above uh, the cameras. Um, you know, there's... there's um, there's a suite of remote sensing instruments. You know, there's a visual and infra infrared mapping spectrometer. Uh, there's a composite infrared, uh, you know, uh, instrument as well as the sort of the visible uh, cameras. Uh, there's actually one of the instruments is the called the radio and plasma wave instrument, and it actually is capable of bursting data at higher rates than than the cameras are. So when they're you know when we're flying through a region around Saturn that that has some really interesting you know plasma or, or magnetospheric observations, you know, some of those instruments can really ramp up their, their data and, and, uh, and, and, and collect, you know, large amounts of data in a short amount of time. I think probably, you know, the biggest data user per unit time in terms of a sustained data rate more than a few minutes or so is actually the radar instrument because huh. they, they transmit and receive and they get, you know, swaths of, of image, radar image data uh, back from from the, the surfaces, uh, you know, of, of whatever body we happen to be be flying near, and uh, you know, they're they're definitely capable of of, of collecting hundreds of, of megabits uh, of data in a very short amount of time, which is an appreciable fraction of the size of the recorder. But you know, if you ask the instrument, uh, you know, team leaders, they might all they might all compete and brag a little bit about how you know how much data they can they can contribute. So I I might get a few emails about this if if. if um, if I seem to be picking sides. Now, I know that a, a particular uh, challenge with planning Cassini's observations is the fact that all of the instruments are bolted onto the side of the spacecraft. You can't actually aim any of the instruments without turning the entire spacecraft, um, which means, of course, that, that if they point in different directions, then you can't have the same you can't have two instruments pointing at the same target at the same time. So all of the optical instruments are pointed in the same direction. So the cameras and the spectrometers can all take data at the same time. But the radar instrument is pointed at 90 degrees to that. So that, I imagine, has created some headaches for you. Yeah, I think actually the headaches are more borne by other teams on the project than me. That, that's the kind of headache that, that affects the tactical teams that are trying to sort of share time between... Um, the different science instruments and investigations more so than, I mean, we sort of said, well, uh, you know, the, the strategic view in that is we tried to figure out who's going to, how's going to share time, and we come up, came up with an example of that to sort of illustrate some of the difficulties in the day to life, and we said, wow, that's really going to be hard, and then the other team said to really take that and actually try to make it work, so, but you're right, it, and actually there's a little bit of a backstory in that that that's worth telling, especially these days, you know, the Cassini, I have a I have a model of, of the Cassini spacecraft. So oh, this cool. is this is what Cassini looks like, um, and it it doesn't really have a scan platform or any sort of uh, major turntable. All the instruments are kind of here's a here's a the optical remote sensing palette. I know it's probably hard to see given the video quality. Probably most of you are getting, and and here's uh, some of the fields and particles instruments. Um, this thing here is the magnetic boom, uh, the magnetometer. Uh, most of the, its components are on the end there. Um, but yeah, you pretty much have to turn the entire spacecraft. The radar uses the main dish there um, in order to point an instrument at anything. Um, and um, that design choice was actually not the original design of the spacecraft. It used to have a scan platform, but the scan platform was removed because uh, some years ago, you know, before Cassini launched, uh, the whole program was at risk of getting cut because, you know, it's it's a flagship mission. It was a high cost mission, and uh, some of you may have read some recent news stories about, you know, the NASA science budget has, has sustained some cuts recently in the president's budget, and you know, a lot of people here at JPL and around NASA are trying to sort of figure out how best to to balance those those cuts across the agency. And there are some missions that that may be at risk and some that have already been <laughs> identified as at risk or worse. So, so kind of that thinking that's happening today is pretty similar to sort of the kind of thinking that, that took place on Cassini. And, and the design choice that they made was to remove the scan platform because it was a significant 
you know, it's a complicated, you know, piece of equipment to sort of have an arm with a, a two gimbal motor and to mount things and to make sure that the cabling is all run and the, 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 all the instruments are, are thermally stable, that kind of thing. Um, and they knew the operations implications were going to be tough. I don't think they quite knew how hard at the time, but, um, but that was a design choice that was made, you know, in effect to try to save the project. And a lot of us are, even though we're, it's a headache to deal with it, a lot of us are glad that they made that choice because who knows what might have happened otherwise if they tried to push it through. But, uh, you know, it's all about sharing. Um, the scientists, you know, have had to learn how to share. And it's a, the kind of lessons that, you know, we're all taught in school. You know, that uh, the scientists submit proposals for, for their highest priority, highest and even middle priority stuff that they want to observe. Um, the projects, you know, has a process whereby decisions are made as to who has control of the spacecraft. And, you know, everyone gets a, an appreciable fraction of what they want. And, and whoever is in charge, you know, they, they pick the pointing, but a lot of times some of the other, uh, some of the other science teams can sort of ride along with them and, and get some of the same data. Also, fortunately, you know, we have 12 instruments. <coughs> um, a couple of them operate rarely. That's radar and radio science. Uh, so of the 10, that 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 remain, um, you know, about half of those, they don't really have very strict pointing requirements when it comes to pointing to something. It's really only the instruments like the cameras that really have to aim specifically at a target. So they can be made happy with a little, pretty small compromises amongst the the teams, and that's that's a, that goes a long way to to solving our problems. Um, but it still takes an enormous amount of coordination to try to figure out who's going to share and, and with what time. I think it's gotten a lot easier because a lot of the scientists have gotten some really good data uh, so far. So their careers aren't on the line if they don't get this one observation most of the time. Right. Although I think that as a scientist, there's, there's one thing that is particularly difficult about the fact that the radar instrument points in a different direction from the optical ones. And that has to do with, fi with gravity and figuring out um, with gravity flybys of the moons in order to figure out whether they're differentiated or not. The, the idea is that um, you know how Earth has a, uh, has a rocky mantle and it has an iron core. So most, most of its mass is concentrated at the center. And that's something that has helped us understand um, the geologic history of Earth, how it was all molten at one time, or at least, uh, at least partially molten, and, and how it's differentiated. All that heavy stuff went to the center. Um, the amount of differentiation that a planet or a moon has can tell you a lot about the amount of energy that was available to drive geology early in its history. And so it's a very interesting thing to know um, how concentrated the mass of an object is toward the center. Um, and also simply its, its mass at all. Just the, and in order to do that, you fly a spacecraft rather close to one of these objects while you're broadcasting a radio signal at Earth. And you do, you do very um, sensitive Doppler tracking. Well, if you can't point the optical instruments independently, then chances are good that you'll be taking a really close flyby that would be great for imaging, and you can't use it at all because you've got to keep your radio instrument pointed exactly at Earth. And so that has, um, that's meant that there haven't been very many good gravity flybys of, the, of Saturn's moons, which is, um, you know, it is data that we'd like to have. I think that there's a couple of the flybys late in the mission have been um, earmarked for gravity. So um, we're, we're getting some of that data, but not as much as we might have. I don't know if you have any comment on sorry, that. Sorry, yeah, I was, I was looking for my mouse. I was trying to okay. unmute, and I, I had to find my, my mm -hmm. mouse in order to do that. Um, yeah, that, everything you said is, is definitely true. I, I think when it comes to Titan, you know, Saturn's largest moon, uh, circumstances have, have been a benefit to us because, um, you know, Titan has an appreciable atmosphere. Most people might know that the, at the surface it's actually even 50% more dense than the Earth's atmosphere. It's the only solar system body with an appreciable atmosphere. Uh, it's sort of a world in and of itself. Um, would probably be a planet if it just happened to not be orbiting Saturn. Um, Bigger than uh, Mercury. Yep. Um, Titan, the really low flybys that are on in the 950 to 1,000 kilometer range um, and up to around 1,300, um, because of the atmosphere, we actually can't use reaction wheels for our control systems. We have to use the thrusters. And you, the use of the thrusters significantly compromises you know, the radio science's ability to, because they, they rely on, you know, they, they depend on no 
no forces being exerted on the spacecraft except for the gravity of the, the body they're, they're flying by. You might want to so pause and explain the difference between reaction wheels and uh, sure. reaction control si and the thruster um, system. The reaction wheels are, are wheels that, uh, momentum wheels that, that add or take momentum away to, you know, they, they spin, if you want to turn the spacecraft this way, they spin the opposite direction so the, the net momentum in the spacecraft is, is the same. But because th thrusters, you know, actually expend, you know, gas out into space, to sort of both turn and potentially move the spacecraft uh, by with by small speeds, change the speed by small amounts. Um, but because the thrusters actually you know rely on expending you know hydrazine gas at, at high speed, it it will change the position and velocity of of the spacecraft in doing that. Whereas reaction wheels just keep everything internal. You know the whole spacecraft is going to continue on the same path regardless of how you use the the reaction wheels. So um, radio science very much wants to use the reaction wheels because they don't want any perturbations on the trajectory of the spacecraft other than the perturbations caused by the gravitational field of the moon that they're flying by. Now, because of the close Titan flybys, we can't use wheels. Radio science, you know, is willing to give those to radar um, to, or, or other instruments to sort of study the, the surface of Titan. Um, around 1,300 to 1,500, 1,600 kilometer flyby altitudes by Titan. Um, uh, radio science, that's, that's a great place for radio science to do gravity. Um, the remote sensing instruments, the cameras that, that want to look at Titan, they're actually perfectly happy being further away most of the time. And part of this is because even at 1,500 kilometers above the surface of Titan at the typical speeds we, we fly by Titan, they really can't track the features fast enough just because our reaction wheels aren't, aren't strong enough to turn the spacecraft at really high speeds. Um, so, so there's a nice sweet spot for radio science to operate. However, at the other moons, there's no atmosphere, so we don't get this sort of convenient um, separation of, of, of instrument operability. And you also uh, don't get nearly as many encounters. Yeah, we have to, we've really had to pick, um, you know, we only get a, a, a small handful of encounters at, at each of the other major moons. Um, and that's because we use Titan as our sort of tour engine, because Titan's so big, that's what we use its gravity assist to, to sort of propel us around the Saturn system. So we're always flying by Titan on, on, not on every orbit, but we're always on an orbit that flies by Titan at some point in the future. Uh, and we have to really work hard, or rather the trajectory designers, I should say. I'm using the royal we sometimes, but the trajectory designers have to work really hard to get uh, flybys of the other, of the other moons. Um, but I believe we just, I should look it up. I'm, I'm sure there's a handful of people online that, that know the answer to this already. I believe we just actually had a gravity-centered flyby. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, I think it was a Rhea. Anyway, there, there are definitely some icy moon encounters that are being targeted specifically for, for radar and, and radio science. And, and the teams are, even though we're in extended mission, you know, it's, they're definitely getting totally new data that they hadn't gotten before and hadn't even conceived of being able to get before. Which is, which is very cool. And, um, and this mission, it's going, it's, it's, has a very long mission extension. It's going to last until 2017. And the, the last few orbits are going to be kind of dramatic. I'm wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, yes, I would be happy to talk about the orbits, those orbits because um, those are, those are, are very definitely very exciting orbits. I was just trying to look up that encounter and I Oh, don't worry about it. We can second. talk about it later. Okay. I think it might have been um, Dione back in December. Otherwise, it might be. We can, we can, we can post something later on that. Mm -hmm. um, so when we first planned the, the tour, we call it the tour of Saturn. Uh, it was, it, the prime mission was only going to be four years from 2004 to 2008. Um, and we really didn't specify was, what was going to happen after that. I think we were all hoping um, and maybe even counting on a mission extension because, you know, that's, that's where you really get the biggest bang for the buck. You know, you've already made that huge investment to get the spacecraft out there, and now the investment on a per-year basis in terms of just keeping the team running is pretty small, and you could still get huge amounts of science for a mission extension. But we never really conceived of what the end of the mission would be. You know, would it be like Voyager, where it's just flying deep into space forever, or <clears throat> would it be more like a mission like Magellan or Galileo? which are orbiters and probably more likely to go in that direction where, where eventually once you run out of, you know, so your spacecraft resources um, or things start, start to break, which doesn't happen often, but it's possible, um, you have to end the mission by sort of impacting on, on some, some body. Um, uh, so there's a very clear, discrete end to the mission. 
anyway, once we started planning uh, the extended mission, uh, we had some really s smart trajectory designers that figure out a way to um, to fly between the rings in the planet. We we pretty much stay we pretty much stay away from the main rings of Saturn. You know, these are if <clears throat> when light has a has a tough time getting through the rings, chances are a spacecraft would too. So we're pretty much flying, you know, sort of out here in, in these regions and, and, and many, many Saturn radii beyond that. Um, and, you know, the rings have what have been called gaps, but really aren't, really are not remotely empty enough to fly through safely. So, so we never even conceived of the possibility of getting really closer to the rings than, than you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of kilometers. Um, but they actually figured out a, a way to get to just the right orbit where you could um, have a sort of a ring plane crossing just outside the main rings. You could hop all the way over the main ring system and fly between the rings of the planet. And we've got uh, 22 orbits uh, that we're planning that will have those passages. Um, so, so most of the orbit is, is, you know, a little bit further away from Saturn, but this one crossing is between the rings and the planet. And that allows us to collect a whole bunch of science that was never even conceived for the mission before. It, it almost, you know, if, if, it were, if, if NASA was planning a mission, it would almost merit its own, its own mission. Um, and we're getting it for, for, you know, at a bargain. Um, and you could do things like measure the mass of the rings. We really don't actually know how much stuff is in the rings at all. Um, you know, radio science is really excited because, you know, you can measure a lot more accurately what the internal structure of Saturn is. And actually, not only radio science, but, but the magnetometer, you know, all the fields and particles instruments are really excited because there's a lot, a whole suite of different things that you can measure about Saturn by getting so much closer to it than we ever, than we ever had before. So well, will the there whole be community much is really excited. Will there be much you can do with imaging in, with those close orbits or not? Um, I'm I'm sure the imaging team has has a has a meaty list of of, of stuff that they want to look at. Uh, certainly, it will allow us to get closer to the rings than we've ever gotten in terms of the inner rings, the C ring, and there's a faint ring called the D ring, which goes almost all the way down to the the atmosphere. Um, you know, we'll be traveling at about 30 kilometers per second when we cross between the rings and the planet, and that's that's awfully fast to be tracking anything. Um, so I think mostly their observations will be a little bit on the wings, uh, sort of looking up, down at, or up at the rings uh, and the planet. You know, they can. We'll get rather close to the to the poles. You know, there's a lot of interesting features that are they're at the poles of Saturn. You know, there's a huge hurricane on one pole. There's a hexagon, fluid dynamics, weirdness happening on the other. And certainly these are opportunities to get um, much better images of, of those, as well as its aurorae um, with some of the other instruments. So. So that, yeah, this, there'll definitely be an opportunity for, for great images uh, from this. Um, I kind of wish our cameras had a wide enough field of view that you could you could actually take a sort of a movie of sort of diving down, skimming over the cloud tops through the rings. But but our, our cameras are because they they typically have to take pictures of things that are very far away. They're sort of posted stamp uh, fields of view, um, and we don't really have time to do like a you know 50 by 50 mosaic of images and patch them together. But much as we like to. Yes, we can dream. <laughs> um, well, we're about halfway into the Hangout time. I want to start encouraging people to post some questions. If you have any questions for Dave in the, in the comments on the, on the Hangout, I've, um, I see a few that are there already. Yeah. I want to see if, uh, if, Dave, if, if there was anything else you wanted to talk about um, before we threw it open to questions. Any other um, subjects that we haven't covered yet? Um, we haven't talked about the dust hazard. Yeah, that, that would take... That we could do that for five minutes. Let's <laughs> let's hold the five minutes for that because we should definitely feel there's already some. I'm already reading some interesting questions there that that we should field. Cool. But but we talked. We Emily and I thought about like trying to think of a problem that could sort of uh, better illustrate sort of how the scientists and the engineers have to work together. So, and I I thought I'd talk about something that that I blogged about on Emily's blog as a guest blogger uh, years ago. I think it was in 07, but I'm not sure. It was, because 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 it was 06 because it was 06 because it was your maternity leave. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I'm sure you remember what year it was. Um, so one of the things, one of the responsibilities that that I had um, was to make sure that uh, the spacecraft wasn't taking any chances when it came to dust hitting it. Um, uh, Saturn, you know, if a, a lot of you may have seen, this is probably 
about our most famous image from the mission, um, and it's the suns behind Saturn. And you can see this, this outside the main rings, there's this kind of big fuzzy ring here. This is the E-ring. There's also some other features in there which wouldn't come through on the, on the, um, the camera. But if you're familiar with the image and, and you call it up, you can see there's a lot of other stuff. Uh, Saturn's a pretty dusty environment, even outside of the main rings, which, which we don't plan to, to pass through. Um, and, you know, trying to figure out how much stuff is out there and whether it's big enough, you know, to, to be a danger was, was a, a thorny problem because we, we didn't have a lot of data on those rings. That's why we were going, right? It's kind of a classic catch-22. You know, if we knew exactly what was out there and we could do our analyses with perfect knowledge, we wouldn't need to go as much. That's why we're going to study it. So, so whether there's softball side stuff, which clearly will, you know, will kill, has the potential of killing the spacecraft, whether it was marbles type, type stuff, which seems pretty dangerous, uh, you know, the speeds at which these things are coming at us, or whether it was, you know, I don't know, the size of a BB or the head of a nail, which you could probably can't even see in your camera, um, is a question. And so, um, the, basically, the way to solve that took both scientists and engineers because the scientists had to tell us their best guess uh, at what was out there. What, what was the available data? You know, you had to get all the world-class, you know, the dust scientists, Saturn scientists in one room and have big discussion, big workshop about what was likely to be there. Um, but you also have to know the nature of the spacecraft, you know, like what, what areas of the spacecraft are vulnerable to dust impacts. You know, most of it's covered with this sort of gold foil. What, what, what is that substance? You know, the spaceship designers have to tell you what it is. And that's, that's this stuff here. This is... Uh, hold, it very hold it very still for a second, sure. model let your camera. Yeah. This is, uh, this is t typically called thermal blanketing. It's usually many, many layers of material. Um, it's designed to keep, uh, keep the spacecraft thermally stable. It also has some of these, some of these layers of foil have it's really hard to see, have tiny holes in them. If I was backlit, it would be easier to see. Maybe I can turn it a little bit. Uh, and that's, that allows, you know, the gases that are, that are inside, you know, uh, at launch to sort of breathe out slowly through, through, the, through, the, um, through the holes. Um, you know, will this protect you against dust impacts? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, it feels flimsy. It's many layers. Is it like Kevlar, Kevlar or is it like, you know, uh, tissue paper. Um, it turns out it does provide a lot of protection because anything, hypervelocity impacts are such that a, if it hits anything, it tends to break up whatever's hitting it into a shower of much smaller particles. So, so you have to know the engineering to know sort of what's vulnerable in the spacecraft, you know, where are their computing systems that are side by two branches of, two redundant branches of one computing system side by side that are only protected by one plate of aluminum and no blanketing. That's, that's what's driving, actually, our analysis. Um, and you have to know, you have to know what, the flight, you know what the spacecraft's made of and, and where those things are. Uh, and you have to also be able to talk to the scientists and figure out you know, how big this stuff is. Is it softball size? You know, is it BB size? And how many of them are there? And my group is the kind of, typically the group that would have to sit in the middle of that and do some kind of analysis to, to figure out how to calculate these things with the actual trajectory that we were planning. And the results were, we actually had to move the trajectory a few times to avoid regions that we thought were dangerous, but, but for the most part, it didn't really, it didn't really hurt us too badly um, uh, in doing these analyses. We weren't getting near the main rings, and everything outside the main rings is, is pretty much pretty small stuff, or, or very, very uh, rare. So. People viewing this podcast may not appreciate the geometry that, that Cassini actually has to cross the ring plane twice on every single orbit. So, and the ring plane is where most of this dust is concentrated. So um, twice in orbit, you're passing through the place where there's the most dust. So you have to ask the question, is, am I crossing at a place that has too much dust or too big particles for Cassini? Yeah, that's right. One of one of our one of our ring plane crossings. You know, it, it's it's kind of hard to visualize, but if if you can imagine an orbit around any body, you know, the orbit has to be somehow centered on the body. You know, you can't have like a halo orbit up here because that would violate the laws of, of of orbital dynamics. But if you you'd have a, an ellipse around any body, and no matter how you orient that ellipse, if you if the body has an equatorial plane, oh, there you go. It's going to have to pierce it at two points. 
Now, one point's always at Titan, because we always have to be flying by Titan, because uh, that's our tour engine. Um, and the other point is usually, is almost, is pretty much always further in, because uh, nearer than Titan is, are a lot of satellites and Saturn, of course, and, and we spend a lot of time studying those as well. So, um, and that's the one that we've, that's the one that we've typically had to, had to manage in terms of hazards to the spacecraft. You know, sometimes that inner point is just outside the main rings. Sometimes it's in this fuzzy ring here, because that's the orbit of Enceladus, and certainly we study Enceladus a lot. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of, bunch of dusty rings. It's hard to see here, but sort of in between. And making sure that we don't place that crossing uh, in the wrong place has definitely taken a lot of a lot of analyses. And, and don't you turn it? Don't you use the the radar, the radio dish as a shield yeah. sometimes when you're? So I thought that was cool. Yeah. So I should take I should take the probe off for this because the probe is on Titan right now. So um, I believe this is the side. This is the one of the sides of the spacecraft that we worry about. This is um, this is where a lot of the computing hardware is, and it's. Uh, it's uh, in front of it are these uh, are these things called thermal louvers, and sometimes they're open to let heat escape from from the computers, which are you know producing heat and have to stay cool. And when they're open, there's there's no blanketing here, uh, even though there looks like there is gold behind it. There's only one sort of thin layer of aluminum between those computers and space. So if a particle were to come in and and strike here it could you know penetrate that or, or cause a shower of, of stuff to to hit those computers so what we do is we do this if you're the dust particle you have to plow through a big high cane antenna to get to anything else so that's that's what we look for we look for multiple surfaces of protection each one of which would turn you know a particle that's this big into a hundred particles that were much smaller and that's that's how we that's how we do some of the protection and I think you actually call that pointing in the RAM direction, right? Yeah, the, the RAM direction is sort of a keyword for, uh, it, it, it def I agree, it sounds, it's a funny word to use, it's a funny phrase. Uh, the RAM direction is sort of the, uh, you know, it's the into the wind. Um, I don't honestly know where the term came from, that, that might be interesting to, to look it that makes, up. Well, it makes me think of a battering it. ram. Yeah, yeah, that, that, could, that could very well be it. Um, but uh, the wind is, uh, you know, where the dust is coming from. And it's not necessarily the same as the direction of travel. You know, these particles are moving, too. So it's kind of like, um, you know, if you're any of you guys out there that are that may be sailors, you know, if you're if you're you know, on a sailboat and you're trying to avoid another boat, you know, that you're both traveling at a, a particular speed, you can't just point away from it. You have to sort of watch it for a while and figure out if it's on the same course as you or, or not. So. So you have to do sort of a vector uh, subtraction to, to figure out um, exactly where these particles are, are coming from. It's not always a, an intuitive direction. A lot of times they seem to be coming straight from Saturn or straight from the, from the opposite direction. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I always, it, it takes a little work to explain to people why that is sometimes. <laughs> Well, I think this would probably be a good time to start with the questions. I'll yeah. start with the ones that I've that I've seen in the comments um, on the on Google Plus, but I'm also getting a few questions in from Twitter. So we'll see how many of them that we can get to. Sure. Um, can we start with Craig, or at least? Get sure. To yeah. I'll start. That's an interesting you, question. You go ahead and read them. Make sure okay. you read them aloud so that people yeah, understand sure. what you're answering. Yeah. So Craig Hutchinson. Hey, Craig. How's it going? Um, he was wondering what uh, what what's going to drive the the you know the end of of Cassini's life. What's if, is there a limiting uh, factor? And he he was asking about RTG power. Those are that stands for radio isotope thermoelectric generators. That's where we get our power. Um, a propellant or funding. <laughs> um, we've already talked about Cassini's end emission plan, so I hope that answered that question. Um, yeah, funding is always a good question. That's not up to us. I, I don't I don't anticipate funding ending our mission before what our plan is 2017 with these really exciting orbits. Just because of the science value of these orbits, we've demonstrated that it's 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 it, it, Everyone's excited that's heard about this, not only in the science community, but, but at headquarters as well. So I don't think funding is going to be a problem. 
Um, Although I will say that that uh, I do know that the Cassini's budget is being um, is being cut, and that is going to affect the amount of science that can be got out of the spacecraft um, during the mission. And yeah. uh, well, Dave is not allowed to tell you this, but I am allowed to say <laughs> that you all ought to write your Congress people and uh, and tell them how much you like space and that you would like your tax dollars to go to space, at least for those of you who are Americans. Well, I, I, for I, Europeans, I'm, you have space programs too, and and I don't know exactly who to tell you to write, but write them too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to tell you that we're we're definitely looking at, um, you know, how we might what funding cuts, how funding cuts might affect what science what science we can do. And yeah, um, th some of the options that were asked, you know, that we're trying to study, you know, have less than we would like. Um, so there there is definitely a potential impact if it gets cut. But but cut to zero was really what I was referring to, and I, I don't I don't think that's in the cards for us, fortunately. So. Um, uh, of the of the other, you know, you talk about power. You know, the 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 power, the, the radioisotopes that, that we carry. You know, the power profile goes down with time. It's about one watt a month, so it's a pretty small amount, and it's pretty steady, and it's quite predictable. Uh, and even in 2017, we have plenty of power to not. We've never had enough power to like turn on every single thing we can think of at once. But we definitely have enough power to operate in in all the science modes that, that we need to, to collect the data that we want. And that, that'll still be true in 2017. We're definitely tracking it. We definitely have to play a few games in order to make sure that we have enough power for suites of instruments to operate together. Um, and that's part of what keeps us busy. But we definitely have that. Uh, propellant, propellant we're looking at very closely. We, you know, we launched with a couple of thousand kilograms of propellant. Uh, and what I mean that's the, the propellant that I'm talking about primarily is is the propellant that comes out of the uh, that we use for the main engines for the large maneuvers uh, and these are the phasing maneuvers that we use we'll definitely need that propellant to get into these exciting orbits um, we only have something like between 100 and 200 kilograms of that propellant left so a tiny tiny fraction of what we carried at launch um, and a, a really interesting study is how much of that propellant can we get out because you can't get all of it out you know if you imagine it's like a ketchup bottle you, you're never going to get all the ketchup out of the bottle right there's always going to be some stuck to the side and how much you get out you know uh, we can't exactly take the spacecraft and you know shake it and so that it all falls to the bottom um, Actually, it's, it, now that you mentioned that, that's, that's something that they did try to study with the Stardust spacecraft before they turned off its transmitter. They knew that it was running on fumes. They barely had enough um, fuel to, to get it past Hartley two, um, sorry, Deep, um, Temple 1. Um, and so at pretty much right after that encounter, they had a sequence where they just told the spacecraft, use, you know, just keep firing until it's gone, and then we're going to turn off your transmitter. And that was sort of a data point for them to figure out how good their modeling had been on how much yeah. fuel was actually left in the spacecraft. I, I bet they had more fuel than, than the propellant engineers would have, you know, signed their name to. Uh, there are a lot of anecdotal stories of, you know, you want to be conservative to make sure that you have enough for what you really need to do, but, but a lot of times, you know, you you do the math, you do the analysis, and you want to be careful about it. And you usually things usually wind up going going better better than expected, or not better than expected, but but better better than you feared, and sometimes not as well as you hoped. But although with um, with Cassini, just like with Galileo, the consequences of estimating wrong are are kind of high because you want to make sure that you don't contaminate any of the moons that we think might have liquid water and and therefore could harbor life. Yeah, Enceladus, uh, you know, is often, you know, this is the body that has these great exciting plumes. It's, it's, it's spewing mostly liquid uh, water, vapor, and ice crystals into space. Uh, the leading theory is that there's some subsurface liquid water reservoir that's supplying that. So Enceladus is definitely off the table in terms of things that we can allow the spacecraft to hit to end the mission. Um, but we're going into Saturn, and that's definitely, you know, a, a, a good choice from a planetary protection standpoint. So I so I, I think just to just to just to tie up Craig's question, we're, we're definitely spending the most work um, between RTG power, propellant, and any other sort of consumable that's on board. Uh, we're definitely spending the most work analyzing the propellant situation to to sort of make sure we have enough to do what we want. Uh, at the moment, we're 99. Our statistics are we're 99 percent sure that we'll make it to the end of the mission. It's, it's gone between 96 and 99, so it's, you know, pretty high numbers that gave us a lot of confidence. That's an A in any, in any school. Um, but, uh, but it's not 100, so we're definitely doing a lot of work to make sure that's, that's the case. 
Um, I, it looks like I answered, I hope I answered Doug Isbell's question about the fraction of Cassini's attitude control propellant. Oh, well, that's, There's actually, he's asking about attitude control propellant. That's, um, that's a different question, and we've only used a little bit more than half, so we're, we're really in good shape there. Uh, we launched with 132 kilos, and I think we we're, we're 60, we got 60-something kilos left, 63, 62 kilos maybe. Um, so, so that's not going to be a limiting factor. We're, we're definitely in good shape there. Emily, did you have a pick yourself? Or? Well, Craig had another question yeah, that I sure. thought was good about um, the uh, DSN time. If you know, if there's an emergency on another mission, um, then you then they have to turn the the uh, deep space network antennas to that mission, and you don't get your transmission time. So how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? Yeah, um, whenever another you know mission has an emergency, um, and even even in the planning stages, when another mission is going to have a critical event like like the Mars uh, Science Laboratory landing on Mars. Um, you know, it's, it's the job of the other missions to really get out of the way and, and make sure that they have what they need. Um, and, you know, if it causes us to lose science, well, we lose science. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a small price to pay to make sure that, that the emergency is, is solved quickly. Um, the, you know, and, and that's usually what happens. We just, you know, we don't get to transmit science that we wanted. Uh, even, like, bad weather at a station can, can cause an outage, and, and sometimes those outages have been more painful than others. Uh, but, you know, the good thing is that, you know, we really have had many years at Saturn and, and a small loss. You know, I, I say that and there's some, some PhD, you know, candidate or, or PhD postdoc that, that, you know, at some point has lost the one piece of data they were really looking for. Uh, you know, there's, there's hundreds if not thousands of, of, of students out there that are working on Cassini data and, and any loss of data is, any data is precious uh, depending on who you talk to. So. Um, Kind of a bigger question is how do we negotiate with the other projects for for this this resource? You know, it's there there aren't a huge number of antennas. You know, there's three, four, or five, or six uh, antennas that most of the set that most projects use. You know, at, at each of three complexes around the world, and there's you know dozens of missions out there that are using them. So how do we negotiate with them? And we you know we try we our our requests are pretty reasonable. It's only one track per day. Uh, and it's not a 24-hour track, it's only eight or nine hours. Um, and there are times when we have to sort of, we have conflicts with other missions for, for a particular antenna um, where we have to really work together and explain to each other what we're using it for and, and try to come to some sort of compromise in terms of, you know, whose science is more important, which, which need is more critical, and is there a creative solution that can give somebody part, part of everything. So. so I'm actually surprised you negotiate that directly with other missions and not through the DSN? Well, the DSN is managed here, so the schedulers for the DSN are typically assigned to projects, and they're kind of treated like members of the project. But the schedulers themselves, all, across the projects, definitely all get together and, and, and negotiate things, and, and they, they tell the story, you know, they convey the stories to each other. Um, but there, there are times when, which, when you know, there's, the conflict is, is significant enough that we bring in other people on the project. You know, it's the schedulers, a lot of times I've, I've been one of the people that's, that's been there to try to help negotiate. And we're asking the other project to come to the negotiating table with, with an explanation and a justification for why they need it. We try to do the same. And then we try to, you know, come to a compromise and say, well, you know, you really need that. Uh, we could maybe downlink that data on the next day. Can you give that up? And, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a little bit of horse trading that goes on sometimes. But, but again, it's like scientists, how scientists and engineers work together. You know, a lot of it is about uh, communicating with each other the story of what you need and what your limitations are and coming to some solution that, that is, makes everyone at least somewhat satisfied. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, one of the things that occurred to me with, with Craig's question is um, that there's, there's something that you actually generate over the course of a mission, and that's expert scientists who know about um, processes on outer planets and, and icy moons and magnetospheres and all that kind of stuff. And, and you know, with Cassini being such a successful mission with such a large science team, um, and, and we know when the end of the mission is going to be, there's actually a, a problem that's going to be coming up, which is where do all these scientists go when Cassini is done? Is, are there going to be other outer planet missions? Are th will there be a follow-up mission to Titan? Will there be one to Europa, to Uranus or Neptune, where these outer planets experts will be able to use their expertise, or will we, will we not have one? Somebody did on Twitter ask the question, what is after Cassini for Saturn and Titan? I wondered if you wanted to talk at all about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Write your congresspersons <laughs> and demand a mission. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, we JPL has been been uh, ha in the in recent years has been doing a lot of, of planning to go back to Saturn and also to go to Jupiter. Uh, there's even been some studies to to go to Uranus because we've only had a flyby mission at Uranus, um, that being you know Voyager two, and we haven't had you know we've had orbiters at both Jupiter and Saturn, so maybe it's Uranus' turn. Um, NASA headquarters, you know, the the decadal survey, which is sort of a, a big survey of, of the leading scientists that, that, that report to NASA or that, that, that advise NASA, you know, has, has definitely weighed in on these three bodies. There's definitely scientific value to go to all three of them. I, you know, a few, a few years ago, the decadal survey, I mean, the, the, the decision seemed to be that, that Jupiter and Europa was going to be the next outer planet's target, and there's definitely studies underway going on here. Um, I think the problem is now, and, and this is definitely, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, publicly known that that the the Jupiter slash Europa mission is maybe competing with the same funds that might be used to sort of keep the Mars program alive. So there's there's definitely some some you know t I mean tough decisions immediately behind us and and ahead of us as well to figure out sort of what is really gives NASA the most value per dollar. But but that's a good point. You know if if we wait 20 years to do another outer planets mission, you know a lot of that expertise might be lost. Um, you know, one can only hope that, that those scientists find a home on other missions and uh, remember <laughs> a, a lot of uh, the technical, you know, need of what they did on, on Cassini, um, uh, you know, when the next Outer Planets mission comes along. I, you know, the, the Outer Planets are definitely have some of the most, you know, some of the most target-rich environments in the solar system. Certainly Saturn's my leading, leading choice. It's a solar system just in and of itself. And, and to kind of set those aside for for a while would would be would be a pity to an our planets fan like me. <laughs> I agree. Um, I'm going to check one more time. I don't think I see any more questions. Let's see here. Oh, ha there actually there is one here, um, which is how have there been any any noticeable dust impacts on on the spacecraft? Have you have you had any injuries yet that you know about? Yeah, th yeah, good question, Joe. Um, the uh, <coughs> Cassini. And don't be scared by this before you let me explain. Cassini uh, gets hit by dust all the time. Certainly every ring plane crossing, uh, maybe not so much out of Titan, but every one of the inner ring plane crossings sees, sees a whole slew of dust impacts. Uh, the vast, vast majority of those are tiny, tiny particles that are pose no hazard to us. That, that dusty ring that you can see most prominently um, outside the main rings of Saturn here, that's the E-ring. That is almost exclusively tiny, tiny particles, you know, a millionth of, of, um, of a meter in, in, uh, in diameter, uh, or a couple of millionths of, of a meter in, in diameter. Um, and the, there's a couple of instruments on Cassini that, that measures those. So we definitely see those all the time, uh, the, including the plasma wave instrument. You know, when one of those particles strikes the spacecraft, you know, it's striking it at tens of thousands of miles an hour. So it vaporizes and creates this big sudden impulsive of ions and plasma and stuff that sort of surrounds the spacecraft and then goes running away along the magnetic field lines. Um, and the radio and plasma wave instrument sees that. It, it's, they've, even, they've even filtered their data to look for these particular signals uh, of dust impacts. Um, we, we have definitely had one, at least one big dust impact, which we think was maybe in the 60 millionths of an inch um, I guess that would be radius, so 100, 120 millionths of, of a meter, excuse me, mixing my units uh, in diameter. And, um, you know, that, that would be visible sort of barely to, to most of us. Um, and that actually uh, has had an effect on the, the, that was actually measured by the cosmic dust analyzer, the dust instrument, and it actually knocked out one branch of its sensors. It, 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 it hasn't really... Um, degraded the performance of the instrument because they have, you know, other branches of sensors that, that they've used, but they think it was big enough to actually knock out a sensor. So, so we know that there's big stuff out there, um, at least that, that big. Fortunately, that, even that particle, you know, it, it may have affected an instrument, but it, we don't believe uh, by, by a, almost an order of magnitude that that would have been big enough to, to cause damage to the spacecraft in terms of, like, you know, destroying it or, or causing a loss of mission. So um, that's about the biggest one that we've confirmed, and, and it was only one in the entire mission. So I, I, I think we, we're feeling pretty good that, that there's not a lot of big stuff out there that, that, could, that could kill us. 
All right. Well, I think that, that pretty much wraps it up. Um, I want to thank David for uh, spending the time with us to tell us about Cassini mission operations. And I'm uh, Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. I blog every day at planetary.org slash blog. I'm also on Planetary Radio weekly at planetary.org slash radio where you can hear lots of other experts talk about all kinds of stuff happening in space. I want to ask everyone who is watching this right now to please plus one it on Google so we know how many people were watching it live. Um, and I want to thank everyone who is watching it not live, recorded on YouTube. Um, and stay tuned next week for, I should have been ready to tell you what is going to be on next week. It is Fraser Kane with some, uh, actually I'm sorry, I'm advertising the next weekly Space Hangout, which is happening tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, um, 18 o'clock UTC, uh, with, which is Fraser, Alan Boyle, Pamela Gain, uh, Nicole Giuliucci, um, Phil Plate, and Miles O'Brien for this week's Space News. I will not be there because I will be helping out in my daughter's science classroom. Uh, so I'll see you there again at the Hangout next Thursday. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Dave. And uh, uh, tune in tomorrow. It's been my pleasure.